That's right, back, Charlie. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Come on, Ian, right? As the big man just said there, people deluded. I'm back again. Thank you very much for tuning back in each and every time. Hope you all had a great weekend. And I hope this Monday has started off in the best possible way it can. And as usual, I hope you and your loved ones are in good health and appreciative to you lot on Twitch and obviously YouTube. Smash the like button, people, if you're on YouTube. Make sure you're commenting and subscribing. Don't forget, across Twitch and YouTube, it's severe against Arsenal live from 8 p.m. tomorrow UK time. So I'll be live from 7 p.m. Let me know your thoughts in relation to the Chelsea game. I'm sure you've seen numerous of my videos, etc, etc. We're going to go over what Mikel Arteta said in his press conference, etc, etc, man. Now, everyone, it's time for the one and only DJ. Appreciate you, Dan L. You're always here. Good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And of course, in some cases, good night. The first thing I want you lot's thoughts is, do you believe Aaron Ramsdale should be reinstated? And obviously, that would mean uh, David Raya dropped. I believe yes and no. I feel where the goalkeeper position is concerned, obviously it looks like Raya is going to be the number one and probably Aaron Ramsdale's days at Arsenal, depending on how content he is with his role and how much he feels he can grab his spot back, are numbered. I don't believe like, you know, it's not like Eddie Nketiah and Gabriel Jesus, for example, you know, even if Jesus isn't amazing, like he wasn't necessarily against Chelsea and Eddie was good off the bench, there's a golfing class. Jesus plays every time over him, in my opinion. I think with Raya and Aaron Ramsdale, it's a bit debatable. I think they're in the same bracket. I don't think either keeper's clear of each other. I do think David Raya's calmness when collecting from crosses and obviously his starting position when we're building out from the back end, probably his calmness to play under pressure. You saw it against Chelsea, you saw it against City, is why he's probably in the team. And I feel in the same way that I actually feel Timber might take Zinchenko's space on a more consistent basis. It's just a natural evolution. That being said, I don't believe Raya should necessarily be dropped. I think he deserves our support. I don't think he's been terrible. But when I look at the big games, of course, you know, again, I did a video on this. Go and check out the video I've literally just posted before this. The Mudrick cross. Whether Mudrick meant it or not, you know, Benjamin White and Odegaard have lost the ball. Raya's probably, you know, as a goalie, you have to anticipate. He's anticipating a cross from Mudrick from the left-hand side. All right, nine times out of ten. We're not speaking about it, but the one time it's a bit of a dodgy cross, whether Mudrick meant it or not, it's still a bloody good goal. And Raya's got egg on his face. I'm sure it was another game where you saw a nervy moment where he kind of tried to play it to Declan Rice, which I covered in the video, and it didn't necessarily work. So, and I just feel with David Raya, it's the big games. I haven't been fully convinced. Like, I don't think he was terrible against Lens more than anyone else. And obviously, when you play out from the back, there are going to be those occasional mistakes, but you have that mistake against Lens. I think he made a great save against Spurs in that game, but Again, it's another game where he's looking a bit shaky. Against Manchester City, as the game went on, he did obviously improve, but you have the Alvarez stuff, the Buki distribution. For every good point I have about Raya in that game, there is concerns. And then the latest Chelsea, again, he weren't the worst player on the pitch, but it's one where you've had another clangor. Um, not that Raya isn't isn't good and Ramsdale's perfect because I feel a lot of people who, you know, are doing too much about David Raya and want Ramsdale back in the team. The minute he makes his inevitable mistake, people will get at him. And I feel when you look at this statistic again, you know, stats without context to a degree don't really mean much. But, you know, you look at worst save success rates in the Premier League this season for four plus appearances. Ramsdale with 55.5. Scrolling all the way down, you've got 61.5% for David Raya. So Ramsdale is first, Raya is fifth. Now, now, again, we are talking about Aaron Ramsdale versus Raya, but does that potentially tell you that there's something deeper than 
deeper than just than two players. Could it be the system? Again, Raya and Raya in his Arsenal career doesn't have the biggest of sample sizes for Arsenal in the Premier League, let alone playing for Arsenal in all comps. Ramsdale's only played four games. But if both of our keepers are there for worse success rates, is there something to do with the system? Is there something to do with the coaching? Because both players can't be there for a reason, have to be there for a reason, really and truly. Is there something underlying that we're not we're not clocking, really and truly, if both our goalies are there? I do think we've improved a lot off the ball, but where I look at creativity with Martin Odegaard's creative metrics, goal scoring, regardless of how many goals we've got on the board, um, and actually defensively, for as many great defensive metrics there are, I still think there's a tenfold. I feel there's a lot of improvements to make. For me, I am edging towards Ramsdale starting, you know, obviously big up Ramsdale and his wife. They've had a son. We all know his wife went through terrible times with a miscarriage. So that's a blessing in disguise. And I don't think he had time to watch the Arsenal game because the kid's probably giving him stress. But if he did, he must be fancying his chances. Now, crucially, Raya's got the faith of, 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 of Mikel Arteta. You've seen it, you know, Mikel Arteta will keep playing you. But you do have to wonder how long before Ramsdale's reinstated, if he is in fact reinstated, really. So for Sevilla, you could argue Ramsdale comes in, he can't buy a first team, he's got a kid. You know, it's a mu it is a must-win game tomorrow, people, in the Champions League, because mathematically you can still qualify, but it don't look good. Two losses um, from three games, it does not look good. And you're flirting with the Europa League at what would be the halfway point come minute 90. Um, and you could argue Sheffield Sheffield United, his former team at home. Again, you can't write them off, but you should imagine, regardless of who's in the team, we are going to have the dominant possession on Saturday at 3pm. And regardless of who's in goal, we, should, we could get away with that. Me, I think Ramsdale will get his chance. I think it's next week, actually, even though this week's just started. I believe it's next week in relation to the game against West Ham in the Cup. I think that's where Ramsdale will get his 90 minutes. After that, I can't really buy it. It'd be nice to have six points on the board in the Champions League, potentially if we were to beat Sevilla in this ideal world, nine points. Because then Aaron Ramsdale and some other players, Arteta might say, you know what, we've probably qualified from this group. Let me give other people a chance. Uh, so yeah, I don't. I think the jury's still out on David Raya. I think the jury's still out on the goalkeeping position. I think you could actually make a case of is actually David Raya and Aaron Ramsdale the starting quality number one, or will we get into a scenario where you look at Liverpool when they got Mane, they got Salah, they got this guy, that guy, they assembled a good eleven, and then you look at two players in their historical strongest eleven. They got Fabinho, two players in particular. They brought Van Dijk in for big money. Obviously, if we had the finances to find the next Van Dijk or if he's out there, of course, we wouldn't want the biggest and baddest players. But with Gabriel and Saliba, I think we're all right. But you look at Alisson, yeah? Could it be a thing? And I, again, I don't know who the goalie is. Could you make a case of, you know, Aaron Ramsdale or Raya? One of them won't be, won't be here in the summer. But 18 months from now, do we need a keeper that's better than them, really? Because I rate Raya. I rate Ramsdale. And I think you lot do too. But you could make a case of either player isn't really good enough, really. We all knew the rotating keeper stuff, regardless of what Arteta says. There's evidently truth in it. But to a degree, it's quote-unquote nonsense. Like, you're going to have a number one. If it hasn't been made clear already to either player who is the number one, like Raya is your spot, Ramsdale keep pushing, or Ramsdale is your spot to lose. End of the day is told by who is starting. You know, Raya has played in the biggest games this season. He played against Manchester City, which for every team, that's the biggest game across the 38-game calendar. Played in the North London derby. Kicked off our Champions League campaign as well. So let me know your thoughts. I'll be watching the live. I always do. Thanks for the content. Keep it up, bro. Arsenal for life. I appreciate that. That's some very kind words and it gives a guy motivation, people. So yeah, man. I think the team took advantage of the situation, but I'm concerned because the win was based on Chelsea's mistakes and not Arsenal's actions. And we didn't win. It depends how you look at the Chelsea game because I do feel we should have had a penalty. You could argue Cole Palmer got away with something similar to Curtis Jones. Um, uh, so where maybe we was hard done by, and again the referees are one thing, but whether you're a professional footballer or a Sunday league, you're taught to you're, you're taught to ex rightly or wrongly, you're taught to expect bad refereeing. And let's control the variables we can control. Of course, if the penalty isn't given, if their penalty is given and ours is given or neither are given, it's a different game. But we can only be in control of what we do. Uh, again, sometimes things just go wrong. You know, I don't think the players stepped out there and wanted to play how they did in the first half or up until minute 77. I don't think Arteta demanded that. Sometimes from a tactical point of view or the players things just go wrong in football so you know think about you lot in your nine to five some days you just wake up get into the office and everything's going wrong you're not trying to make mistakes but everything is going wrong so there could be that but I just want to focus on what we can and we didn't we didn't play with purpose we didn't have it the intensity needed in the London derby going to Stamford Bridge against the team that we've had their number Pochettino trying to turn things around yes I'm happy that we didn't lose we're still unbeaten we've still got a relative top six game top six record sorry but sooner rather than later I hate to be that guy you get the points that you deserve 
I guess in the large scale of things, based on how we ended the game, and I have said this in a video, one thing I like is we this season is we don't give up until the final whistle. But sometimes we're going to get results that our performance is warranted. Let's be real. Against Spurs, based on that second half, we're probably fortunate that we walked away with a point. You know, arguably we're very fortunate. In fact, it's not even arguable. We are very fortunate that Chelsea messed up and Chelsea have to arrest their own issues because they were tuning up against one of the best teams in the Prem. They didn't walk away three points, neither a clean sheet because we didn't look like we had a we had anything. You know, obviously both keepers have made mistakes. Raya, Raya, uh, Sanchez, sorry, presented Declan Rice with an opportunity and, you know, Declan Rice is better than Caicedo. You know what my £100 million pound man does. Trossard got us out of, out of jail, which has been a theme of ours, but it does look very jammy. Again, I think that's testament to the high standards and there are some good things, but I think we need to be a lot more perfect over 90 minutes. Let's be real, even the game against Manchester United United at home, we were good, we deserved to win, but we got away with stuff. Again, you earn your own luck, but we need to be better across 90 minutes. We need to defend a lot cleaner and crisper. And I think I speak for anyone, regardless of what it says, for individual players or collective players for scoring goals, we need to score a lot more. As I said, I think in, definitely not of the Chelsea game, but in the middle third, typically, I don't think there's a team in the world Arsenal can't give a game. Football's decided in the attacking third and the defensive third. And did we do all we can to shut up shop against Chelsea? Did we do all we could to score? We had one shot after like the hour mark. You know, we was waffling about when Pep Guardiola team only had four shots at the Emirates. So what happened there really and truly? It don't really make sense. And to be fair, in a couple of the London derbies this season, Fulham, Spurs and Chelsea, we haven't won none of them. And we've, you know, if we started well, we've ended terribly. If we if we started poor, we've ended strong. But football's a 90-minute game. Of course, there's going to be moments like that, really. You know, Saka, for me, second half looked like a different player. Looked like he shaked off any of the rustiness he had. I wouldn't drop Raya if I was Arteta. All keepers make the odd mistake. Yeah, I don't... I, I'm not saying it's a knee-jerk thing because for me... I'm just thinking, is Arteta flirting with the idea potentially? Because, again, it's more the big games. Ryan's look good when he's had nothing to do passing and whatnot. And I don't think he was terrible against Lens, but he made a mistake. I don't think he was terrible against Chelsea, but there were some shaky moments. And obviously, he's tried to prejudge across his position. It's terrible. I don't think he was poor against Spurs. He made a great save, but, you know... Benjamin White and Saka get the focus of, I think, when Madison set up Son's first goal. But you have to throw Raya in there because he flapped at it initially. And if I'm if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, actually thinking of the City game again, let alone the Julian Alvarez thing, there was a moment uh, Declan Rice cleared an effort off the line, and I don't know where Raya was diving. So yeah, man, but it's interesting to hear your thoughts. Raya shouldn't be dropped. His errors are looked at under a magnifying glass, but I've seen those same errors last season from Ramsdale. I saw the Sevilla match against Real Madrid. I'm now concerned for our match in the Champions League, but Raya may bounce back in the Sevilla game. I mean, Raya's no idiot, you know. He knows he messed up and the players know they messed up. So if you get to start on Tuesday, you need to replay the manager because arguably uh, the, the subs could start, you know, really and truly. Trossard could be banging on the door for a start, even though I think Martinelli was OK. You know, Tomiyasu's probably looking at Zinchenko like, yeah, you can do this inverted flying into midfield thing and passes in that, but... I'm certain when when the chip when the chips are up. I think Eddie and Ketia gave a good account of himself. I am not dropping Gabriel Jesus for Eddie, but he looked all right. My guy Emil Smith Rowe looked good. And to be fair, the last two games, Havertz has come off the bench for, for the foreseeable future. That looks like your role. Come off the bench. Let's see what can happen. And I actually feel for Arteta, we need to learn how to obviously we can play more than one way. The system has changed and all of that jazz. But I think we need to find another way of playing because you look at that game watching it again. Chelsea did a great job of man-marking. They had a system with their front players similar to us. They man-marked us out the game. They kind of limited the options for Raya and actually Saliba in particular to find those passes. When we went a bit more direct in the second half, like you saw what led to Saka setting up Trossard, Raya's gone long into Kai Havertz. So I do think we need to play a bit of a different way. I don't think the midfield... Well, I think Odegaard was terrible, you know. Odegaard's first touch was poor. He was missing. He's still my captain. He's still the baller. He's still the class region. He's still all of that. But keeping it honest, 90 minutes, she was poor. That's the poorest you've played this season. Declan Rice was there. I think Jorginho wasn't terrible, but you know with Jorginho, when you have possession, you're kind of comfy. When you're on the defensive side of things, you, 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 you kind of accept Jorginho for what it is. And for Mikel Arteta, I do wonder, are we going against the grain a bit too much? Like, Are we trying to kind of, in a day and age where the midfield is about tenacity and physicality and things, are we trying to have this Wenger ball sort of rhetoric? Because it does feel like it at times it's kind of easy to read us. Now, hindsight's a wonderful thing. 
typically Zinchenko's done all right defensively by his own standards. But for Arteta, again, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Could it have been worth going with a Thomas Partey instead of Jorginho? Because then, you know, if you've got Partey and Rice, they kind of can cover the space that, you know, that Zinchenko is going to leave all those lapses. Could, if you want to keep Jorginho in the team, could you have put Tommy Asu in there? Not that Tommy Asu or anyone hasn't made mistakes, but he gives us a bit defensively. I don't know. I'm sure the manager's question marking what he could do. I hope he's seen that Smith Rowe can have a part to play because a bit like last season, I knew Arteta, I'm not going to say Arteta was out of ideas in the Chelsea game, but Smith Rowe can't buy minutes. If you're dashing him on, a bit like Nelson last year, that tells me it's last chance saloon. Everything that we've worked on is out the window. Let's try a thing. And again, I pick up every person who came off the subs bench, really, because I think the subs were very strong against Chelsea, which I shouldn't be waffling about because the starters should have. Out of the starters, not that, again, we all take, we were all rubbish. It don't matter if one player was 20 million out of 10 and the rest were fours. That It's a collective sport. If you want to do this singular sport thing, go play boxing or golf. And even that, you know, then there's no such sport that is a one-man band because, you know, obviously if you're a golfer, you've got caddies and things around you, boxers, you've got boxing coaches and nutritionists, so indirectly you have a team. But um, out of the starters, I don't think Gabriel did too much wrong. I don't think Saliba did too much wrong, obviously the handball and that. Um, and I actually feel in the build-up, both of those centre-halves, they're kind of doing that thing where they did at Liverpool against Liverpool at the Emirates where it's difficult to watch a football and watch a man. But if you go and look at the way Chelsea, what led to the the penalty, sorry, they've cut us open. They've, it's a great bit, bit of play. I think it's about eight, nine passes from Robertson Sanchez. Benjamin White's got tight to Mudrick. Mudrick has chested it and then plays obviously continued. It's obviously ended up on the right-hand side. But since then, Mudrick has just made the run into the middle of the pitch and neither Gabriel nor Saliba are, are, are aware of what my man's doing until it's... It's obviously too late, but I think they did all right. I think Benjamin White was terrible. I'm a big fan. He was terrible. I think he was terrible. I think Zinchenko, he needed to get out of there when he got out of there. I think Declan Rice, you, you, was, you was good. Obviously, forget your goal. You was one of them that, all right, cool. You, you turned up today. Odegaard was anonymous. You know, the very fact that Odegaard's first touch was terrible tells you everything. That is something that I don't expect to utter on YouTube ever again. But big up Odegaard. Jesus was poor. Saka got his act together in the second half. But, you know, to get Cucurella was kicking him blind. But couldn't really do much. You know, Saka's the star boy, so we give him a bit of luxury and he's just coming back from injury and whatnot. But again, you know, again, even with Saka, is it any coincidence when Saka's receiving the ball where he can run onto it and take on Cucurella, Cucurella's looking in problems. You know, if you're playing against Bukayo Saka and every time he gets the ball, he's having to go backwards, which has been a theme of Arsenal, and that's something for Arteta to arrest. You're living, really. Martinelli, I, it can be a bit predictable at times, but I don't think you was terrible. You know, I was very... Imp Obviously, I'm going to hold certain players to higher standards because, you know, you, you've got more experience. I think Jesus was terrible. I think Benjamin White was terrible. Odegaard, arguably, one, probably the worst player. You would give or take you and Zinchenko for me as well from the Arsenal starters. You lot were poor. Raya, you know, your passing and stuff generally was OK. But, you know, it's another game where there's a talking point. So, yeah, man, it wasn't a bad game, but we have to count our blessings. I mean, it wasn't a good game, but we have to count our blessings because it could have definitely been better and it could have definitely been worse. We need to take the lessons from this. As I said, you look at our top six clashes. The City game, I don't really have nothing to say with that because it's City. We got a clean sheet, we scored. There's little things we could have done better and whatnot, but let's isolate that. Man United, if we lost or drew that game, a bit like the last two games at the Emirates against Man United, we could have had any complaints because there's a lot we could learn defensively, on the transition, being street smart, etc. The Spurs game echoes that. And now Chelsea. And I'd rather learn these lessons now where, as I said, we've taken points from these games. If you can't win, don't lose. Every point matters, essentially. And if you're trying to pip City to a league title, which is near enough impossible, you know, you need to win these games, especially, you know. God, again, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Had we have started well against Chelsea, we might have got three points. Had we have done what we needed to do against Spurs, we would have got an extra two points like the Chelsea game. Fulham, we were three after coming back from behind, three minutes away, one last set piece away from getting all three points. We let ourselves down. And obviously, we kind of, to a degree, before the Chelsea game, rectified that because we took points off City. But you're shooting yourself in the foot. Again, I'm not asking the team to be perfect over a 38-game calendar. It's impossible. You're going to have bad games. You're going to have these dodgy sort of games. So it is what it is. Even this season, I wasn't happy with the attempt to save... Rashford's strike, nor with his goalkeeping in the Fulham game, was in no man's land after Saka's poor pass. I mean, fundamentally, it's Saka, but you're right, the starting position was effed, and that's what I mean, like... I both of them are a bit shaky. Raya is going to start. We haven't conceded from a corner since Raya's come in. Also, his kicking is better. He sticks to Arteta's plan. It's over. And I, the, the last part of that sentence, he sticks to his plan, which I'm here for. Don't mind really either way. I prefer Raya, though. I mean, I, my, I love Ramsdale. I like Raya. I'm with you. I don't really... we got two good goal, goalkeepers. I don't really care, man, really. 
DJ, it's been a while since I've been able to join us live. Hope you're good. Hope you're good as well, man. Social drains, what have you said? Big up you, because you're always here as well. Um, let me remove this off screen before we look at all the other stuff. That was not a jammy goal. That was a mistake because we pressed in. Rice gets on that ball because we pressed them in the corner. That's a forced mistake. Exactly. That's my point. You know, it's a jammy one, really and truly. Like, we forced the error. And we take the, you know, you get a couple of extra goals. We, you know, it's a mistake from, it's a mistake from Sanchez. You look at Rice, I believe Enketia Smith for a couple of this in a bit. It's a good press, really and truly. And again, it worked a treat. That's what I mean by, again, off the ball. I think we've improved so much, but I do think it has come at a cost on it. Mudrick's goal was a fluke. The keeper is not expecting a shot. Mudrick looked at Sterling on the back post and put it in accidentally. I don't think it was Raya's fault. I mean, whether it's a fluke or not, he did it in it, really. And it is Raya's fault, really, because he's nine times out of ten, I think you're right. The ball is crossed in. Raya collects it, crosses it. It's happy days. We're not waffling about this, but this was the one time it wasn't. End of the day, Raya's in no man's land, really. You know, I hear you. You're, you're anticipating the cross, but you're in no man's land, you know. Again, could again when they go and look at that goal today in training, could you have delayed that decision? Could you have, you know, could other things have happened? Again, as I said, I don't think Raya is alone because while Raya is the poster boy for that, Benjamin White and Odegaard have lost the ball very cheaply, again, on the transition in a game where we couldn't afford to. And the second goal peed me off because... It sounds mad to say, but I actually, I think we only turned up from minute 77 until the end. Smash the like button if you haven't and keep your thoughts coming in. But I feel just before Chelsea scored, like that was, that goal basically came like first five or so minutes in the second half. I actually feel we were starting to get into the groove of things. We're starting to match them. And then again, we shot ourselves in the foot really and truly. I mean, fundamentally, it's right. It's fault. You're paid to, you're paid to keep balls out the back of the net. You're in no man's land. As I said, he's not alone. A bit like the Spurs example, I said, he's not alone. You know, again, in the Spurs game, Benjamin White and Saka are going to get the flak. But Gabriel, Saliba, they've switched off where Son is. It's terrible for Benjamin White and Bakayo Saka with Madison in the first place. And just before that, if you remember, the cross came in, Raya's kind of flapping at that really. And that's the second time I've seen Raya do that because that shot that was cleared off the line against uh, Manchester City from Declan Rice, Raya was moving mad. Now, again, people make mistakes. Things happen. And this is the sign of a good team. Can you get your teammates out of mistakes, which we've kind of done, really? So we keep moving, man. We have to keep moving. Like, it is what it is. People forget that Raya is on loan. Should he continue to put in these performances as he has in the long run. Surely he'll get dropped and Arsenal won't make the move permanent. Personally, I think Ramsdale is playing the long game. Plus, he's been here before, just on the other side when he's arrived to be Leno's backup. It just rem it remains to be seen how long will it persist. I, I slightly disagree, Ry uh, Riley, because I think this is one of those booky loans. I don't think it's a loan per se. I think this is a permanent transfer in all but name. I do. We have heard Arsenal need to get over the FFP. Thomas Frank has said this will become permanent. Raya initially in the summer made no plans to sign a new deal at Brentford. Coincidentally, you know, Arsenal have agreed an option to make his loan permanent. He signed for Arsenal on loan and he signed a new deal, a short-term deal at Brentford. So all parties are protected. So there is a chance we could go back on this, but I, I, I think it's a permanent one in all but name, if I'm honest. But in theory, 100%. We'll see the best of Raya when Havertz plays up front. I hear that, but, you know, goalkeepers still need to catch. You know, as much as the game's developing and goalies are your first attackers with their ball playing ability and you've got all these false nines playing up front and we talk about centre-backs all ball playing ability. Yes, the game has changed, but fundamentally, you still need to be able to catch. You still need to be able to score goals and you still need to be able to defend, man. Zinchenko can invert, but he has to move more forward. We don't need him on the ball in the same line as our six. Our team sit too deep. He has. To, I have to assume then Mikel Arteta is telling him to do that, really, if I'm honest, man. Send him back to Brentford. Nah, man, keep right. Big up my guy, Roms, man. Hopefully we'll see Partey, Rice, Odegaard midfield against Sevilla and maybe bring in Vieira for Rice versus Sheffield on the weekend. I'm not going to lie to you. Maybe we could afford to be a bit more expansive against Sheffield United in terms of you don't probably need Partey and Rice, but I'm not going to lie to you, you know, if possible, Rice, Partey, Odegaard, I'm trying to see two games in a week from you lot. We dropped two points against Chelsea. We need to confirm these three points. I don't know who we've got after after Sheffield United, but I can't imagine the games are coming The games are coming thick and fast and I can't imagine it will be easy. You know, we're gearing up to that November, December, early, early January period points on the board. The games are coming thick and fast. I don't, I, obviously, I hope we stay in every competition, but we're, at this moment, we're still in the League Cup. We're still fighting in the Prem. We still got to deal with these Champions League games and the turn of the year, the FA Cup comes into it. So again, it takes a lot out of you, really. If the number one's position is still competed for now, the time is to give Ramsdale his chance. I don't think he will get, I don't think Ryan will get dropped immediately, but it if it continues, then yeah, man. People saying it wasn't Raya's fault with the second goal, but it was a far post cross. He should still be in. He's 
he would he still would be in no man's land if Sterling got to it. He, I'd keep him still. I think Kai Havertz can be a very dangerous weapon if we can play a bit more direct. I don't think Arteta wants to be a consistent direct team. Why not just move Zinchenko into midfield and end this defensive experiment? But to be fair, if anything, surely if Zinchenko plays in the middle of the park, his defensive frailties, if he does have some, will be highlighted more. There's no hiding place. You look at someone like Jorginho, you know, not that he was terrible, it should be a talking point. You can't get away from the defensive transitions. Again, I don't, I believe, you know, obviously he plays there for Ukraine. Zinchenko is a centre mid. I definitely feel there's scope to play him there, but there's got to be a reason. The best manager of all time, Pep Guardiola, and so far, Mikel Arteta, there is a reluctance to start Zinchenko organically in the middle of the park. There has to be. I, I would love to hear what, what is the reluctance, but I just think he, you know, I just think it's because of all the other stuff. On the ball, he's lit, but off the ball, he switches off a lot. And I think he's a he's he's not he's a bit too emotional in that. In January, we can go after Giroud and send Raya back. I don't know. Odegaard shouldn't start next few games, but he will. I ain't gonna lie, Odegaard's starting for me, man. You know, slap it. He needs to slap himself for that game, right? I mean, Ramsdale, Ramsdale. I'm ordering two questions. I mean, I don't think Ramsdale will get his chance, but back to Odegaard. Like Odegaard starts for against Sevilla for me. It's a big game. We must win. Everyone will forgive you if you put in a performance and you start against Sheffield, but keeping it trill, that's where you want to be. If Odegaard's having a shaky game, or maybe Bakayo Saka, you've got two men that could take their spot essentially. Overall, the team just don't look the same without Partey in midfield. The last time we looked proper fluid was Barcelona in pre-season, and that's the last time Partey played in midfield. Hear that? Don't forget to like and subscribe. But then again, you know, teams, if you want to just play on the Kai Havertz long ball stuff, it will get clocked, really. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being a bit impossible to Mikel Arteta because... I don't want to be a direct team, but I think we need scope to be able to do that. Like, again, you know, as I said, I think chance creation and chance conversion are issues of us. And I think I'm not again, I, again, I don't advocate losing the ball shooting for no reason. I kind of like the fact that, you know, we're very patient. We knock it side to side. We won't force it unless the opening is there. I like that. But I just feel that there needs to be a healthy bit of randomness. And it would be nice to have like a direct striker, a striker that's good in the air. Just if games aren't going our way, we can mix things up because it can become a bit predictable, if I'm honest with you. Elite talking points from you lot. Shout out the Malaysians, man. And I think our fans still have to just be comfortable with our key players or players that we hold in high regards. Maybe, you know, they're, 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 they're like importance in the team not quite being there. Manny, one love. Rice still has, still had so much more to do. What do you mean by that specifically, man? Sorry, I don't quite get that, my dude. But yeah, man, whether Mudrick's goal was a fluke or not, either way, he put it in the back of the net. Like, it don't really matter, if I'm honest with you. And I think people are harsh in that, you know, Rayo has to hold his hands up. But I just feel when you look at in football nowadays, obviously, match of the day are only going to show probably Colin Gallagher playing it to Mudrick and the cross coming in. What what led to it? Because your keeper is your last line of defence. Whether Raya's in the blame or not, and I'm not absolving him of any errors, he's your last line of defence. So as I always say, I'm of his, before I come and ask Raya a question, where's my defence? Where is my midfield? And Odegaard and Benjamin White, two players who I've got a lot of time for, signing new deals, or one of them signing this talk over new deals, love them both. But keeping it honest, they were poor for that. They saw, you know, they went on the, and this happens in football. Football is football. You're going to lose the ball. You're going to concede goals. Football is going to be won or lost on the transition. It happens. But again, I just feel people need to look at everything. You know, there's never just one person involved in it. In the same way, there's never just one man involved when we score goals, unless someone takes the ball from Raya and dances past the whole opposition. Forget about Partey. He's getting phased out. Partey is off to AFCON and he's barely played this season. Rice is our six. Rice just has to get better at line breaking passes. To be fair with you, I think in January, what, do we not lose Tommy Asu as well to, I think, the Asia Cup games? Forgive me if, I, if I'm wrong. And obviously you lose Partey. And for me in January, I know the talk will be over a winger, maybe Pedro Neto, even though I don't think we'll put the bread down for him. And Ivan Tony, and don't get it twisted, I would love, pardon me, I would like a striker. I'd like a winger. But I've been so passionate about central midfield. I think in January, we need to get a centre midfield. I actually, I have no evidence of this, but I think we'll move for a central midfielder. I don't know if it will be the guys linked with us, but I think we'll move for one. And I actually feel we'll probably dip into the market dependent on Timber's status over injury for another kind of, I don't know who, but for another defensive body. And I, I, I'd imagine, maybe not for January, but with this whole Raya Ramsdale stuff, and if it is to persist, then it persists. But maybe we're going to start to look for another keeper that's quote-unquote kind of happy. Like, if you could find someone that is closer to Raya or Ramsdale in ability, but is cool with that Matt Turner sort of stature in the team, which is clearly not because he cut, I think we'd be all right. 
our London derby record going out the window at the moment as well. But hey, well, all we have to say is we've got a goal to Spurs. We've got a goal to Fulham. We've got a welcome Chelsea to our place. We did beat Crystal Palace. We just got to put it right, man. A little bit worried about Ramos tomorrow. His s housery and Dark Arts could have a big influence on the game. I mean, if the players didn't know what they're stepping into, Raya being Spanish, Mikel Arteta being Spanish, you know, could tell them exactly what's going on. You know, again, I do think our form away from home has been a lot better. Like what, the Chelsea game away is the first game in a real, real long time, probably going back to Everton last season away from home, where I think we've been pee poor really and truly away from home. The players know what time it is. And if they don't, you know, go and watch the game that some of you lot played against Lens. Every away game in, in, in football is difficult, especially away from home. And if we beat Sevilla, I can't see us send, selling too many newspapers. But if they beat us for obvious reasons, you know exactly what's going to be said really. So. We need to win, really. You know, no one's going to give us three points, but we need to win. We need to get something from that. It's a dark place, two L's and a, and a victory in the champs. Of course, you can mathematically go through, but then you're just making our job more difficult than it needs to be, if I'm completely honest. So it's an interesting one, man. Keep your thoughts coming. Again, I did promise that we'll look at all the news and what Mikel Arteta said in his press conference, so it's only right. On what went wrong and what went right tonight, well, the fact that we found two goals and got a point there, the only things that went right, really, and we got, we, you know, Declan Rice scored a better goal than I've ever seen Paul Scholes, Steven Gerrard and Lampard score. I'm, I'm capping a bit, 100%, but we, li we, left with, we left with something. But he said, we can see the two and score two. I think where it went wrong was at the start of the game. I think we didn't play with enough purpose with the ball and clarity. We were just moving the ball without really having the intention to threaten them. And that's a really dangerous thing to do against teams like Chelsea. We didn't win in... We didn't win even jewels and in tight areas when we had them, they escaped from that. They attacked open spaces and they're really dangerous and those are really dangerous things to do. So credit to them because they're a top side full of top players and you have to acknowledge that. I don't think anyone can disagree with what the manager has said there. Uh, when we don't have those things, then we've got an average team. True, you know, if we're not going to match the intensity and we're not going to run and be competitive, then we've got no chance really. We changed that and we started to lift the level after 20, 25 minutes and especially in the second half, that's a different game. We became a much better team Team, even though we conceded the second goal and it was disappointing, the way the team reacted was phenomenal, whether it was the players that were here, the players that were on the bench, big up the bench players, man, thinking how am I going to change the game and help the team? So that's the part that I loved. What I really liked as well was going into the dressing room and the dressing room being quiet after drawing 2-2 against Chelsea and being 2-0 down because I know they want more. So those are positives. Well, yeah, I can't disagree. On the bo boss's thoughts in the penalty, he said, I already mentioned it to the referee and I got booked for that. So I mentioned, to, I, I prefer to make no comment. I wasn't happy with the yellow there. That tells you how he feels. Um, on the handball law, well, the law is clear as well in where the ball has to be in relation to the action and it's very close. It's impossible to jump without lifting your hands. It's just mechanically impossible. I think everybody can agree with that. I don't know. There's a cru crusade on defending, isn't it? I, I don't know what they want people to do. I really don't. Like Defenders are soon going to have to jump for headers and obviously get no leverage with their hands behind their back in the same way when they're trying to block shots. It's ridiculous, but... We've seen them given, in it, really? So I'd rather, even though I'm not negating what the gaffer said or what you lot feel or I feel about these dodgy penalties, but we can't control that. In the present day, those penalties are given, really and truly. So maybe we can just look at the build-up. And as I said, they've they've built that. At what led to that penalty from the cross from Sterling has happened from Sanchez all the way. So maybe we could, we you know, if our intensity was there, if we were just sharp off the boys, we was, if we could win the draws that we was winning, that doesn't happen. And this isn't a talking point. So Sevilla have been bad as well this year. Don't know how they managed to get a draw against Madrid, though. So they may have turned the corner with their new manager. But hey, no complacency. They're the best team in the world, really. I don't see us beating Sevilla, to be honest. Hopefully we can't. And they might have to jump like Dolphins, man. There's no point defending nowadays. You can't get out of trouble, really. So, yeah, on the team having character in our comeback, I have no doubt about that. I could see at half time there was a knife between our teeth and we accepted that we have to do much better. The game state was there for us and we had that belief. And when we conceded the goal and the way we conceded, we continued to be like this. And I love that about the team. I'm going to demand that every single day because this is who we are. And when you're not at your best, you still have to create a lot of issues for your opponent. On the second goal, Chelsea scored of, you know, he knows damn well he's seen this, but there's a bit of cap from the manager. I haven't seen it live again. We looked at it from the angle. It's a very strange angle to concede from. I didn't know if it was the deflection or the trajectory of the ball he just doesn't want to put Raya into it and to be honest with you as I said if you're mad at Raya you have to be equally as mad at Odegaard and Benjamin White as well if I'm completely honest RIP Bobby Robson as well uh, Bobby Robson apologies Bobby Charlton people again it's crap news over the weekend while we're upset about the team some people have lost their lives so yeah, it just shows you we should be thankful for things in this world on Ramsdale's chance great I love him I sing as well for him 
Oh, Gaffer. Why for that, Doug? But anyways, every single day we've we've sung a lot for him. Yesterday, because he was a father, the most beautiful thing to do. And he's someone who has this charisma and personality and his love um, around the team. On Trossard's impact, first of all, he's very good and he's got this mentality to always be willing to help the team. As I said, I think Trossard is the best super sub we've got, really. I think Trossard is mad because I think he could get more starts, but he looks a lot better off the bench. And I think his Arsenal highlights, probably excluding the Fulham game and maybe the... I want to say Leicester or Brighton, one of them teams. He's looked better when he's come off the bench with a point to prove, if I'm honest. But big up Trossard, and it shows you why you need a squad. Um, yeah, he's got this mentality to always be willing to help the team. He had an injury that he wasn't able, he wasn't fit enough to play the last few games. And then he played Man City and he had to come off. He worked really hard during the international break to be able to be fit again. Those things, it's like with Martinelli changes the momentum of his season. And I could see that he was ready to come in. It was a very intelligent run, the way he anticipates the cross and the action, obviously the way he executes it, because it's still not easy to score. And I think, you know, you've seen why you need these subs against City. Obviously, Martinelli came on for Trossard and kind of changed the game. Obviously, Tommy Asu and Havertz and whoever else are missing out kind of echoes that against Chelsea. Every sub was great, in my opinion. That's the one thing. All the subs, I couldn't ask anything more of you, man. Always have to give thanks for true, man. You can't, you know, you can't rest on your laurels. So, yeah, Trossard himself has spoken. He said, it's really, it's really well done to the boys not to get our head down. He, um, That's how you can even win games as well. We need to take that with us and focus on the next match. I'm really pleased to score. Obviously, it's nice if you can help the team with either a goal or an assist. And today that went my way. And I'm really happy it gave us a point. It's not easy to have an explanation for that, but... We just changed the gear in the second half a bit more. We played better. We were more aggressive. And you have to win your draws as well. I think we did better in the second half and we we can score goals like that. And I mean, that's upside, that's upsetting if I'm if I'm honest with you, you know, that we weren't winning our, our draws. I mean, I wouldn't accuse Arteta of copying Pep Guardiola for ball playing keepers. Obviously, look at Joe, Joe Hart and Claudio Bravo, but what keeper at a big club isn't isn't a good isn't decent with their feet? You look at Sanchez. I know obviously he gave us a goal, but Sanchez, Raya for, and Ramsdale for Arsenal. You know, Allison isn't going to be heralded as a ball playing keeper, but he's not exactly lacking in that department. Manchester City, it goes without saying. Brighton have a couple of them. You know, Spurs' his keeper is relatively decent with his feet as well. You know, again, I don't think you know Onana. He's a bit terrible with everything else and he's not really getting the rub of the green currently, but he's very good with his feet. It's just a natural thing needed in the game now. So I wouldn't say I agree with your point about hands first, 100%. I don't really care for Rai's ball playing ability if you can't catch, which is a bit harsh to say, but based on that game, yes. But I wouldn't say that's copying Pep Guardiola of all things, really. You know, since Arteta's come in, it's... it's there's been drama over the keepers, Leno and Ramsdale. Uh, who else was there? Emmy Martinez and Leno. Them times. Now we're seeing it with Rayo. Like we've been, we've been here before. Essentially, Declan Rice scored, and he said everyone's been talking about this Beckham documentary. And I watched it for the first time last night. The first couple of clips are the game against Wimbledon where he scored from the halfway line, and I took a bit of belief from that. Okay, so watch Ronaldinho and against Sevilla, I need to see some crave turns and no-look passes and that. I was just thinking that it was bizarre that I watched it last night. Then obviously today, taking the shot first time and scoring, it was a special goal to kickstart our comeback. You've got to keep shooting. If you shoot, you score. Amen. I just wish we would do that. Well, we're not going to score goals like that all the time, but if we would shoot a bit more, maybe things would be better. In a player's mind, you get a split second to make a decision. It's the quickest thing that you have to do. You've got to think whether you pass. Leal was free in front of me or you go for goal yourself. I've just watched it back. It was a great finish, so I was happy with that. And I, actually, it's only Sunday League, but the goal that you lot see me spin a million times in my intro, I agree with Declan Rice because I only hit that because I thought, raw, they're closing me down. Like, there's no time to make a pass. I need to shoot. So it makes sense, really and truly. And I do wonder, is there footballers that are better when they have less time to make a decision or better players that are better when they have more time to make a decision? I don't know. I've also been wondering, you know, it's completely left of this debate, people. But you look at someone like Jude Bellingham, obviously he's a goal-scoring midfielder among all of his great stuff. His dad was a, you know, a non-league striker. So how many of, you know, that knack of scoring goals, has that been passed down to him really? through DNA I don't know but we're going left with everything people staying on task with Declan Rice let me know your thoughts so far he said it's a bitter feeling to be honest because we know if we did it in the second half what we did in the first we would have won the game 
I think Declan Rice is the captain without the armband. Big up Odegaard and shout out to Bukayo Saka for actually captain in the game in the second half, the team in the second half of that game. In football, things throw out surprises. In the first half, we weren't as good as we wanted to be. In the second half, I feel we showed that character again like we did against Man City. And to get to a point in the end was really an important result. I would say the Chelsea first half, or in fact, let's just say the Chelsea game. That was the worst I've seen Arsenal this season in general. And that was the worst how I, that was the worst how I've seen us off the ball. That was the worst 45 minutes in how we were on the ball, off the ball, winning our jewels and all of that jazz. So hopefully, you know, there will be bad game, many more bad games to come with good games, but hopefully it's not like that, people. Um, if I'm honest with you. Being 2-0 down is tough. It's really tough. I, I think you always want to go into games thinking that you'll get three points. But from the way we came back from 2-0 down away from home, the Chelsea fans and players were really up for it. We showed that fight and character. Even though we didn't win, there are positives to be taken there. The mentality is there. The belief is there. And we don't want to be beaten and being the best that we can be. And I'm being a bit unfair because I don't believe this point that I'm making with the players. But to play devil's advocate... You know, when we went into the Chelsea game and the Spurs game, some fans of, of our fan base were probably a bit too overconfident, a bit complacent. Has Did that filter to the Arsenal players, really? Because I didn't see that against City. Did that filter against Chelsea that we can just turn up and play ball? Did Was that at the Emirates against Spurs? I don't necessarily believe it, but I would love to just find why certain things happen, people. So... It is what it is in that regard. So you lot can read that if you want, but I won't be reading it to you. Uh, Declan Rice has spoken on the comeback. There was a, I hope these are the points he made. He spoke about our structure. Oh, here we go. I think the first half from us was probably the worst we've played all season in terms of sloppiness, not doing things in our structure, not doing things in how we've worked, but also credit to Chelsea. So that tells me we lack discipline in the first half. If we're not sticking to our principles and what we've been doing this season and what we're, we individually know and collectively know, we, we lack discipline in, 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 in our working tasks in that game, really. So I'd love to know why that is. I'm sure there'd be an inquest internally, but I guess I'll never find out specifically. But yeah, the manager said this week that we've been really unlucky this season and they're going to be a tough impulse. They've been really unlucky this season and they're going to be a tough opponent. They've got incredible players. It was never going to be easy, but to show that heart, that character when you're 2-0 down with 15 minutes to go. So if the management telling you all week they've been unlucky, they're a good side and, you know, just looking at Chelsea, they're a massive club. They've won stuff. They've got some great players, some expensive players. They've got Pochettino. Again, I don't think any of my players went out there to put in that performance on purpose. But why did that happen then? Like, why did that happen collectively? Because there's got to be something. If one or two players are off the pace, fair enough. But every player, even the players, Gabriel, Saliba, uh, Declan Rice, off the top of my head, who are Martinelli, who I don't think, Jorginho, who I don't think were terrible, but no one could look at that first 45 minutes and say, I'm playing at my optimum. So why is that? Is that just one of those things, like I said earlier, where it's football, crazy things happen. Sometimes you're not at it. I don't know. Sometimes it's about that inner belief that you can do it. And once I got the first and we kept pushing, it was about driving the team on and making sure that everyone else believes that we can get a we can get something positive here. So in the end, it's a positive result from where we came from. He then said, instead of driving the ball with my laces, I had to curl it. It was a quick instinct about whether to pass the ball to someone or take it on. I was buzzing, but was still two, we were still 2-1 down and I wanted us to keep going and get another one. I'm glad we did it. Obviously, he came here as a six, but, you know, can we be shameless and say... Declan Rice is already becoming an all-action midfielder. I want to be shameless, people. And, you know, something is telling me, how many goals you get for West Ham last year? You can't have got more than three. Surely not, Declan. Why is it not loading? You see, the internet don't want me to bang people. But why that's loading? Why are we all the players complacent when we haven't won anything yet? I hear that. But I, I, naturally, things happen, isn't it? I guess Raya are much more mistake here. Is the first half of the Chelsea game worse than the first half of the Spurs game or the first half of the City game? Of course, 100%. The Spurs game, it was more we were shooting ourselves in the foot and we was a bit lack lacklustre. The City game, I don't think we was that terrible. I think we was cancelling each other out. And as the game went on, we started to grow in belief. The, the, the first half against Chelsea, there's nothing really. Tactically, we looked in discipline. You know, anything can happen, but you need to be competitive. You need to play with purpose. You need to play with intention and you need to be competitive in your draws. And we weren't. You know, off the ball, which we've been so good, we were terrible. You know, we were terrible at that. So I, I would probably say, yeah, really. How many goals did you get last season, Declan Rice? But sorry, people. I just I smell an agenda. How many goals did you get? What's going on here? All competitions, please. You... Oh, fair enough. He got five goals and four assists for West Ham. The agenda might need to chill. Has he got an assist this season? Two goals. You know what? Three more and you do it. 
12 goals, 10 assists in 213 games. Can't lie, I didn't think Declan Rice had double figures for Premier League goals. So, yeah, big him up, man. Don't know if you mentioned it because I just joined, but Jorginho was nowhere to be seen. To be honest with you, I actually think watching the game twice that I don't think Jorginho was terrible. I don't. I think with Jorginho, I'm not saying you necessarily are saying you're wrong, but I think it's just because if Jorginho's playing, that means there's no party and defensively, it did look a bit suicidal for Mikel Arteta watching that first half again. In hindsight, really, you've got Jorginho, you've got Zinchenko, you know defensively they're passengers, even though Zinchenko, watch, there was one incident, Chelsea broke and Jorginho was actually filling in for Benjamin White. So I'm not sure. This says Arsenal could sell two stars and then beat Liverpool to Andre deal. Arsenal could step up their interest in Flo and Aze midfielder Andre if they're able to move first teamers on in January. Sources have told Football Insider. Really? I, I definitely, without reading this, I hope this doesn't mention letting Jorginho or Partey go. You lot, you, Jorginho, Partey, Ramsdale, Smith, bro, anybody who wants to cut out of this club, that has to be in the summer. You know, it's a myth, really. It's believed the likes of Jorginho and Partey are subject of interest and could move on in, in, in the mid-season window. I mean, if we have to sell them to bring in players, it's a bit shaky because I think we need more midfield options anyways. If I'm honest with you, on paper, we seem well-stopped, but... Guys that are going to play in that pivot behind Odegaard, there's only Declan... Well, yeah, it's only Declan Rice and Partey, really. Jorginho, there's a couple of games across the season, but he's not someone like Partey, if it or Declan Rice, that you could bet on 38 games, regardless of what Mikel Arteta wants to implement tactically. Them two can line up in midfield. There's a couple of games for Jorginho. El Nene's got a role for this year, but neither are going to be here long-term. Neither are fully convincing. Lokonga, happy belated birthdays over there at Luton. And it, even when Fitty weren't pulling up any trees myth really you know you've got young charlie patino who we hope gets into the pathway but need him to just keep developing and doing his thing we have got fabio vieira smith row and and obviously kai havarts who have been used to varying degrees but i don't think arteta sees them as consistent men and again arteta and edu were midfielders i i shouldn't have to keep waffling about midfield i guess i, I don't know if we'll sign a midfielder in jan because in the summer with kai havarts and declan rice you know that's over 100 odd million touching 200 on two midfielders but you know, Havertz plays everywhere but hasn't grabbed the role. Declan Rice, he's, he's great, but he's not Superman. Part A, the only criticism is injuries and he's contracted until 2025 and is now 30 something now. So there's a debate to be said. I'm actually doing a video on this, by the way, people. So we'll have to see. Let me know your thoughts and smash the like button, people. Departures for either player could see Arsenal rival Liverpool for the signing of Andre, but exits will have to be sanctioned before Mikel Arteta's side make their move. Again, we've been linked with the 22-year-old. I still think he heads to Liverpool. I just think they've done their groundwork. But nonetheless, that's that. That's that for you lot. What's this? Uh, Leandro Trossard has been speaking in relation to the title challenge. He said, obviously, there are a lot of teams who have strengthened their squad and it will be a close call at the end. But it's still early on. We need to take it game by game and try to win every game. I don't think you can disagree with him. Well done to the boys. They never let their heads go down and kept believing. You can see you only need one moment to change the game. I knew when Saka put it on his left that I had to make the run. Lovely. We spoke about it in training and it was the perfect ball and I knew I had to make contact and it was a great goal. And, you know, obviously, Reese James went to sleep. So I'm happy for that, really. Arsenal, Newcastle, Tottenham, West Ham scouting Valencia's Javi Guerrero. Again, the 20-year-old has been, you know, starring for Valencia. Scouting and doing knowledgeable background checks doesn't mean we're going to move for him. But at 20 years of age, if you're playing in La Liga, you're obviously going to get admirers from elsewhere. But nonetheless... In relation to the 20-year-old, Arsenal, Newcastle United, Tottenham Hotshire and West Ham United are among the clubs to have watched over Valencia midfielder Javier Guerrero in recent weeks. Sources have told 90 Minutes he's been currently enjoying a breakthrough season. There's a couple of young players coming through in the La Liga now. Obviously, a you come off the bench for Barcelona. Obviously, they got that Yalmao guy doing his thing. What's the one that plays for Atletico Madrid? They've got a young midfielder. Valencia have a couple of young players generally around their squad. Um... So it is well, it is, people. He's got three goals and one assist in nine La Liga games. He was a bit part player for Valencia last season, but featured in their final 10 games of the campaign and helped them obviously beat relegation. Once again, in the recent weeks and months, he's been scouted by at least four or five Premier League teams. Notably, all four were in attendance for Spain's under-21s 1-0 victory over Scotland in September. Apparently, Manchester United are also looking at him and Barcelona have looked at him in the past, people. The sporting director has said, we are aware that we have a player with enormous potential for the future and the ability to perform at a good level now that's why the club have precisely moved him up to the first team in recent months it's not our plans to sell him to any club he's contracted until 2027 and has a release clause of 100 million euros which is about 86 million quid of course he's in no position to go for anything near that but it tells you that they can hold on to him um, in theory or negotiate a decent price i think this is speaking about the same thing as well people 
Um, yeah, he's been told he's not for sale. So we'll have to see what happens in that regard. Uh, Romano has claimed Arsenal is still interested in Douglas Luiz, who signed a new contract recently for Valencia. So the 25-year-old, it would be difficult to obtain him. It's also important to say that many clubs are keeping an eye on Luiz's situation. Arsenal wanted Luiz one year ago. He's always been a player appreciated by Arsenal director Edu. So is that Arteta's guy or is Edu his guy? And he's, he's, Arteta likes him because of that. But for sure, Douglas is a player appreciated by many clubs around Europe, not just Arsenal. We know the style of the Gunners. They like to keep an eye on players they've already been following in the past. For sure, Luiz is going to be one to watch in 2024. Let's see if it's January or summer. It's never easy to sign players from Aston Villa. They are flying and Embry is doing great things there. Again, half the players were linked with Pedro, Neto, Ivan, Tony, Douglas, Luiz. You're going to have to be able to probably pay a bit more if you want to prize them from such people. What's Romano said in relation to this? He's spoken about Raya um, and basically said we're going to get him permanently. He said he's very happy. Arteta is very happy with his start to life for Arsenal. And he's claimed that, you know, the deal will be made permanent next year. Uh, David Raya is very happy at Arsenal. We had an interview with Aaron Ramsdale in the Daily Mail about wanting to get back in the team. At the same time, David Raya is doing really well. Mikel is very happy with Raya. The feeling since they closed the deal is that it's a loan deal, but all parties believe this formula was agreed just for FFP and that in reality, Raya can be considered an Arsenal player on a permanent transfer starting in 2024. So that probably means when that fee does go through, that's going to be factored into, I guess, the financial window of what we do between January and probably next summer, really. This is why I don't predict a big money signing in January, but it don't matter if they're a big money or cost anything as long as they're the right players. Uh, some of you would have seen that Mason Kocha, forgive me for mispronunciation, the 17-year-old England youth international played for Arsenal's under-18s and has been on trial at, at a couple of clubs, really. Um, so I have to see exactly what goes on with him. He did feature against Middlesbrough. I don't know if we'll take him on, but he also has been on trial at other clubs and he's got interest from Rangers and Brighton. So it remains to be seen exactly what's going to go on there, but... That must tell you there's some admiration. Previously, it has been stated that Arsenal have been linked with players at Galatasaray and apparently we're scouting four of those players. Is it a case of we've been linked with the same four players and now someone's just been creative with their articles? I don't know. Apparently, we're keeping tabs on, on Boy, Kareem, Artigulu, any an attacking player, as well as centre-back duo uh, Victor Nelson and Barbakai. Forgive me for mispronunciation. Apparently, you know... Photo Sport has reported that Arsenal scouts were in attendance for Galatasaray's game against Besiktas on Saturday, along with scouts from Brighton, Manchester United and Burnley people. So we'll have to see how that one goes. But yeah, we were allegedly linked with Sasha Boy in the summer. Apparently, Romano said Arsenal, one of two English clubs being kept informed on the conditions of a potential Sasha Boy deal. The 22-year-old Frenchman has just changed agents, but there have been no concrete talks with Arsenal yet. Galatasaray made it clear during meetings in London that their asking price for Boy is 25 million euros. Fair enough. Um, the man himself said, I'm a Galatasaray player, but I have much bigger ambitions. I think they'll understand me and they'll respect this because I've never cheated. Is he, are you in a relationship or are you talking about your football team? You only have one career. You need to go all out. Arsenal's interest is very flattering. The Premier League is the league I'm aiming for. Therefore, we'll see what will happen. Fair enough there, really. Arsenal, I think we've already seen this with Douglas Lewis. So good, I got it twice. What's this? Well, I mean, it's just opinions about Aaron Ramsdale. We don't really care for that. Ornstein's previously said we've got a lack of a budget in January. From what I hear, there isn't much budget or desire to do significant business in January. Um, and he did say this could hypothetically change depending on potential departures, availability of targets, injuries, form and so on. He said, I don't think we can question owners KSE's willingness to do so since taking full control of the club. It's more a matter of what the FFP rules enable them to do. The ride deal going through as a loan with an option to buy illustrates that Arsenal are sailing close to the wind. My understanding is that once they are in more comfortable FFP position and able to spend properly again, which is shows we need to get Champions League beyond the obvious for more for reasons more than just football. The first outlay will likely need to be turning that move into a permanent transfer. Transfer. Therefore, I'm sure they'll have a plan as to how they wish to proceed. Most probably as things stand, that will start with a striker. We've seen all the names linked. There's also a long-held desire to provide backup competition for Saka, potentially depth at left centre-back, left-back cover if Tierney leaves and so on. I'm sure Arsenal, like most teams, will be scouring the market for top emerging talent and good value for money deals, which obviously will be easier to do than the big money transitions. So transactions, sorry, so that makes sense. Raya's not excellent goalkeeper. The I'm not sure what you're saying there, my dude. This kid looks good. Villa are building a good team. You can't just buy their players willy-nilly. Emre is cl cl clocked on. 
we have a, we've had good results but poor performance all season wait until we click we need to start clicking man and it'll be great once and if we fully start doing that don't forget to keep smashing the like button so that's what Ornstein had to say folks according to reports Arsenal and Chelsea have been made aware that Ivan Tony is looking to leave Brentford Romano has said uh, many clubs are keeping an eye on Ivan Tony and he's another big name to watch for January Arsenal and Chelsea are informed on Tony's situation they know his situation very well and that he's ready to make a top club move in January it will depend on how how much these clubs want to spend because Tony will likely cost at least 60 to 65 million to sign. Let's see if Chelsea decide to attack the situation or if Arsenal go for him or someone else. Because, for example, we know Spurs didn't end up signing a direct replacement for Harry Kane in the summer, though they are happy with their squad. In any case, Tony is absolutely ready to leave Brentford. So let's see if January or the summer. And of course, always let's respect Brentford in this saga because they insist to receive important money for their star player. And there you have that. I was reading that with Benjamin White. You can see our results, people. We've ended it in a draw, hopefully, against Sevilla. Tomorrow we do well. We've spoken about this Fluminense. Andre, you, we've spoken about Douglas. We see, I don't try to miss anything for you lot, people. Uh, obviously, Ben, ben Mee has spoken about Raya, so we can add that. We can add that. Arsenal has spoken about the lack of diversity in this picture. Again, you lot can read that. You know, I would like diversity to be reflected and it would be nice for the young black girl out there. But it is what it is in that regards, folks. Uh, you can see I'm doing a lot of reading, can't you, folks, people? Arsenal are to step up their efforts to sign Pedro Neto in January and reportedly prefer him over a striker like Ivan Tony due to budgetary issues. You, But we've seen reports that we value Pedro Neto at 40 million. Wolves value him at 70 million. Obviously, if he wasn't playing as good as he is this season and he still had injury concerns, our, our hand would be strengthened. But again, can you really see us getting Pedro Neto for 40 million? I suppose it'd be a decent profit on what Wolves initially paid. Or do you wait till the summer? Because he's again been another one. He's been linked with Liverpool. He's been linked with Man United, he's been linked with Arsenal. I'm sure there's probably other clubs. So everybody's interested in everyone. People's willingness to make moves happen at a particular time. Who knows, people? So we'll have to see. Again, if you want my informed opinions on Raya and Trossard and a bit more of Chelsea, I did a I did an analysis video earlier today. So check that out when once we're done here. And don't forget, tomorrow we're watching Sevilla against Arsenal. So make sure you've turned on your notifications and do me a favour, smash the like button, people. Liking, commenting, engagement. This helps the YouTube algorithm. So I don't think there's any much more to say. In fact, I know I'm asking a lot of you lot of people, but I see the Football Blacklist Awards have been announced. So if you have five minutes, you know, Nominate the dude and big up you lot in general who have done such already, people. So, yeah, there's a link there. All the links are in the thingy. So, yeah, what else are you lot saying? Tony is a skip. He ain't the answer. For certain for certain for a certain fee, man. Once I start hearing 70 and 80, I like Tony and it wouldn't be my money. I wouldn't care if I'm honest with you, but it's a, it's a bit mad. I'm kind of agreeing with you. You think Jacob Ramsey could make a good number eight? I like him a lot, but again, Villa... You know what, what needs to be done. Everyone's got, I think, what's helped the smaller clubs in the Premier League is everyone's got money. You can't really bully no one. If you want, De respectfully to West Ham, if you want Declan Rice, it's 105 million. If you wanted Harry Maguire at the time, it's 80. And there's plenty of other examples where it has or hasn't worked out. Everyone's got money. And obviously, Villa have, ha have been having a good project. They've got a good thing going under Uno Emre. They've tied their players down. It's a bit like Wolves. They've just given Pedro Neto a new deal. He's contracted until 2027. Of course, if the player starts stomping his feet and making noise and depending on his agent, things can happen. But, you know, the clubs are in a position of strength. And obviously, January, there are some deals to be had. Contracts are running out. Players might, might want to leave um, and things like that. But generally, these Ivan Tonys, these Pedro Netos, these kind of players... They're going to cost a lot because people don't want to sell them. Arguably, if Arsenal did what we needed to do in the summer, we wouldn't want to. I don't think anyone wants to buy in January because you would have enough with your squad. But it's not the way the cookie crumbles. Fix the like, folks. So she'll get on to them. Appreciate that. Um, your comment about Ornstein line. We made 70 million in sales. Why is he lying? I, I wouldn't say I, I, David Ornstein's lying necessarily, but I would say nobody really knows, really, if I'm honest with you. You know, next summer, I can't see us making significant money, you know, unless you sell Aaron Ramsdale, Smith Rowe, you get a buy for Tierney, you know, but again, on the, on the, on the basis of that, you know, Tony, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in Tierney, but he only left on loan. So for all his ability, why was there only loan fill, offers fielded? We've got to deal with Lukonga and Tavares, you know, so it'd be an interesting one. Partey's got a year left on his deal. It'd be interesting to see because there were, there were, murmurings per se about Partey potentially being allowed to leave last summer you know if he hasn't signed a new deal by next summer or if Arsenal have made a decision already which you'd imagine they have it, you know we know where that's going 
I'm surprised Raz put it in the bins like that, though. He needs to shoot every time. I mean, keep doing it. You got specific details to put down for the nomination. Uh, just part of my email, really. That's, I appreciate EJ for doing that. But that's my email, just that. And it's just going to ask you why. If you're going to nominate a category, one to watch slash media. Where, where are Wolves in the table? I don't see them selling. Exactly, because they've got to deal with their season, really. You know, in the summer, yeah, they might be willing. There might be a willingness to start. Does Trossard deserve to start more games? If so, who should be dropped for him? Black man supporting black content. What a name. Appreciate that. Um, It's a bit harsh. It's one way you wish you had 12 players in it, because I would say yes, but I'm not dropping Saka. I'm not dropping Martinelli. I'm not dropping Jesus. So you, I guess you could, Trossard could play in the 10. I'm not dropping Odegaard, but, you know, based on the Chelsea game, you could say that's where he could get a look in and maybe him and, and Jesus could keep swapping in positions, if that makes sense. So, yeah, really, but I wouldn't drop it. And to be honest with you, I think Trossard looks better as an impact sub. If I'm, one, if I'm very honest, I don't think he looks as good when he starts consistently, but he is a player that deserves more starts. He's a player I would like to get more starts. If that answers your question. Thoughts, thoughts on lack of chance creation, DG? Sorry if you've covered it. Honestly, I don't know, man. I don't know. I just think it's come at a cost of how much more solid we're trying to be in terms of our pressing and our and just off the ball in general. Obviously, you know, what we do on a pitch is a result of a training field. So once you see Gabriel pull out into that left back channel, Zinchenko go a bit forward, Raya's starting position and obviously every other player move. I think there's just a fixation on that. I do feel our attacking play is good, but I do think it can be a bit choreographed and it needs that healthy bit of randomness. I would like a striker who's decent in the air just so that we could have a bit more variety. It seems like it's a bit too scripted, but arguably football's never been more scripted than it is now. You know, you don't really see too much individuality. You know, before it was the individuals that made the team. Now it's somewhat the system really and truly. And players, you know, how many players have we seen? They look great at one team and extremely mediocre at another. I don't think it's, it's never been more about systems. I'd say it's more about it's, it's done because the players are playing, but it's more like managers are playing at each other, if that makes sense. Football has become a lot more robot robotic. Has Eddie Nketiah ever scored a good clean strike where he slapped the ball? He must have, man. Leave Eddie alone, man. You're a bit harsh. And I was getting my hopes up in that game. I think Eddie had a chance. The angles were difficult, but I was thinking, yo, is Eddie going to score against his former team and we're going to ring the phone and things? I think Eddie gave, it definitely in the last three, four games, Eddie's cameo off the bench against Chelsea, that, that was probably your best performance because I, I did think he started the season really well. And generally, he's been all right, regardless what you think about him. And then he's probably gone off the boil. But yeah, man, I think with Jesus and Eddie and Ketio, as much as I love Jesus and I've got time for Eddie, I don't think anyone's ever 100% fully convinced that they're going to be clinical in front of goal, really. And it is, a quite, it is quite volatile, really. The only one that I kind of have faith to consistently score goals is Saka, because you've done it two years in a row now. Obviously, I like the fact that Odegaard got 15. I like the fact that, you know... Martinelli got a goal disallowed against United and he should have had more, but he got 15 last year. Jesus can get double figures. Eddie can chip in here and there, Trossard here and there, but there's not enough confirmation. Saka's the only one that I, in my head, obviously all the other score goals, but you're the goal scorer for me because you've shown me enough body of work. It's quite volatile, really. You know, obviously we've, What's that? Seven, eight, nine goals that Xhaka scored in the Prem gone. I don't know where that's going to, who's going to pick up the pieces. Obviously, Declan Rice, he scored, but he's not paid to score goals. I want to see him add goals to his game, but that's not him. Partey will score a screamer or two literally across the course of a season. That's not him. Kai Havertz, I guess, gets into them positions, but like Eddie and Jesus, he doesn't know what shooting boots are. So it's a bit volatile, if I'm honest with you. Do you think Zinni will get phased out once Timber's back? Phased out's harsh. But I do think Timber will play a lot more. And it's games like that. Like, obviously, Zinni is better than Timber slightly. but not even slightly. He's better than him on the ball, isn't it? But Timber isn't too far away from him in terms of Timber can play football. But he's just a lot more switched on. He's a lot stronger defensively. And it's a bit like, obviously, I'm a big fan of Tini. But once I saw what Zinchenko could bring for all the faults and comparison to players, you were introduced to something different, these inverted fullbacks. And now with Timber, I was introduced to something different. I'd simply say different options, man, because as you've seen throughout the course of the season, there's times Zinchenko's played well. There's been a couple of occasions, definitely at Stamford Bridge, where he say, oh, you know what? While we haven't missed Tini, it would have been lovely to have a Tini in a game like this. It would have been lovely to have a Timber. Tommy Asu could play here and the other one, because Tim, I mean, Tommy Asu was poor against Lens. You know, he was amazing in his last couple of appearances off the bench. But this is why you need a squad, in my opinion. New players, we literally have a new midfield with players that aren't used to possession football and we don't play in the pockets again. That's personnel change. 
Uh, with Declan Rice, I'd say I'd say that because I wouldn't say West Ham are known for having the ball. You could say for England, you know, nine times out of ten, England have a lot of the ball. But I slightly disagree. You know, obviously Brentford never historically have the ball every game, but they're a very good ball progressive side, and Raya was doing all of that sort of stuff. So I would say Raya, you definitely could do that. Rice, I agree with you that point you're making there. Have Archie's at Chelsea been on the front foot, regardless of Chelsea's things. So I, I, I disagree with that slightly, my dude. But new players do play a point a part. I think Partey is class, but his time's up. Sell him at the end of the season. Time to be ruthless uh, because of his contract situations, and you're never fully convinced that he'll he'll be fit for the majority of the se season. Even though I think he was fit for about thirty odd games last year. And I, I think it's, it's it's the year Arsenal have to make a, a decision. He's contracted until 2025. Are you giving him a new deal or not? Um, I'm only selling part if we're bringing someone in whose levels or has or isn't too far away or it doesn't make sense, essentially. It's like when sometimes one of the parties sold last summer. If we're not bringing in the Kai Sados, who's a completely different player, but a strong midfield option or a Lavia or, you know, the bunch of names, I don't think it makes sense, really. You know, their scope in theory in the summer, Smith Rowe dependent on games, Ramsdale dependent on what happens, Partey dependent on what happens. Three key sales, but you've got to replace them, really. Could Arsenal even say, do you know what? We have, we, we'll let Partey run down his deal. If he wants to leave, he leaves 45 million. We've got our value and we give someone time to, to grow. Like, for instance, if we had Lavia in our squad, your Partey's little bro, you, you learn what Partey's doing. You can come into certain games, but you're not necessarily a regular. Sometimes I feel like Arteta wasn't a fan of the size Arsenal had back when he played for Arsenal, thinking Santi. So now he wants big and tall players, Rice, Timber and Havertz, the target man. Which I, I disagree, but I think we've needed to add height and we've needed to add, add physicality and that's helped us defend a lot more. It's helped us be a bit more robust. Of course, you've seen tall players that are weak, short players that are strong, but I think it was a necessary addition, if I'm honest with you, to bring height into the team to allow us to be more direct, if that makes sense. Any thoughts on the changing narrative surrounding players caught gambling? I feel like Tony was hung out to dry by the British press, which while to uh, Tonali, they highlighted an addiction. Uh, yeah, but I don't think it's a race thing. I was I spoke about this. At, oh, sorry. Tiny Loose is playing. Sorry, I, I'm trying to get a video for you. Um, big up Kendall, Newcastle fan. Go and check out her, her content and make sure you get onto her about having her own channel because she needs to do that a lot more. But we spoke about that and I, I don't quite think it was a race thing necessarily, but we all know there's certain luxuries. I do agree with you that Tony was hung out to dry and to gnarly and a lot of players it's more kind of focusing on the victim thing. I wouldn't say Tony helped himself either, my dude, because, you know, the interview that he gave, he kind of said it weren't my fault. He didn't really take accountability per se. Um, I, I I don't know how I feel about players and gambling, in it? Because, you know, you're wearing, and I know they're changing it, but they wear, obviously we ain't got it, but you're wearing, uh, yeah, it is a change in sentiment, Richard, 100%. Nine times out of 10, there's a gambling thing here. Half of the time you go on a website of any club, you're seeing gambling stuff. You go to a, any football match, you know, there's, there's, places for you to do little bets a lot of people you know do accumulators on this um you know there's the billboards and all these things so it, it, it's kind of difficult to get away with it from it really and truly and i just think the play is either you know I, I don't know i think the player should be sensible but from a human point of view how could you not like want to do that and a lot of these footballers they've been gambling from young as well not that it's right like they've been gambling from young a lot how many times will you see an interview with a player come out and, you know, look look at Corker. He'll sit there and say, oh, when I, when Spurs sent me to Swansea, there was nothing to do. I started doing up the casino thing and whatnot. So I, I do feel sorry for them. I feel when it's so much in your face, naturally you're going to have a moment of weakness, really and truly. And what I would say for the players getting caught, there must be other people doing it on the back row. There must be managers and things. And the Premier League's not not not, not an exception, but you'd imagine the lower leagues is, is probably where it's more rife. Like you look in Italy... Serie D, Serie C, the gambling is rife. Partey should go, but the number of ball passing midfielders out there is poor. Can you name one as good as as good at progressive line passes? I would say Zubamendi, but you're right, man. But this is where these men that are in charge like need to find players, really, you know, because the minute the window closed last summer, the planning needs to have happened for 2025 with a bunch of targets. It feels harsh considering it literally advised everywhere. I feel for the players, but on the other hand, the clubs need to step up and do more. And that's it. The clubs need to step up and do more. But at the same time, rules are rules. You shouldn't be doing it in it. So I have empathy. I don't necessarily have sympathy. And I think it should open up a wider discussion around gambling and, and footballers and all of these sort of things, if I'm honest with you. 
Big up my guy, Stylish. As the man said, drop a like, 96 people. I need 96 likes. Ra, didn't Trippier get in as much trouble? Even Trippier. Trippier got bagged. He was out for a while. And then he learned his lesson. I think he, I think his one was slack. The thing is, there must be different bets. Some people are probably betting themselves, doing accumulators. I think Trippier is one where he told people, like, bet on me because I'm moving to Atletico Madrid. Obviously, I don't know what's going to happen with Tonali, Paqueta, uh, Zanolio. There might even be a bunch of other players, really. Odegaard has been poor, man. Smith Rowe needs more minutes. Bench players for me suffering. I would love to see Smith Rowe get some more game time. You know, no one will be more happier than me. Or maybe Guna Lee will. So we'll have to see exactly what happens in that regards, people. But with it being an hour and 10 minutes, I appreciate you lot for tuning in with me, your talking points, your difference of opinions, and your engaging chat. I'm going to go and have a late lunch, people, and try and download Football Manager 2024, because if it downloads in time, I do want to play with you lot. Before I let you get out of here, people, if you don't promote yourself in this live, no one will do it for you. So if you want more of my thoughts, I dropped a video before we went live. Go and check such out. Don't forget to join me tomorrow live from 7 p.m. because we're back in the Champions League. We've got Champions League action, a difficult test against Sevilla. What else have we got? That's not for you lot. That's not for you lot. And yeah, nominate the guy for this award, people. Let's try and get another one. We already got 30 under 30. Let's try and bag another one, even though it's a bit political with this one. But we're going to try. We're going to try. DG is right. Empathy, not sympathy with the players betting, especially this play in elite ball context is key them these are millionaires i'd say it's more the habits and they need help if it, if i can download 24 in time then i'll do my thing man but yeah people i like the talking points we go a bit left but it's amazing but yeah man smash the like button subscribe if you haven't god bless you all don't forget to stay safe have a progressive week hope you and your loved ones have good health appreciate you for tuning in man safe <laughs> Tongue time! 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 Tongue